Quidditch has become a worldwide phenomenon, expanding well beyond the books and movies. It's beloved by a huge number of people, and has even been made into a sport for muggles. And no, I do not play it. It's completely mental. The fictional sport has many rules and a very interesting history. In this video, I'm going to break down its origin and history, its rules, the equipment used, the many different leagues, and highlights of the last 1000 years of the sport. This is everything you need to know about Quidditch. So let's start with how the game is played before we jump into the history. It's played on a pitch that is shaped like an oval. It is 500 feet long and 180 feet wide. Each team has 7 players, 3 chasers, 2 beaters, 1 keeper, and 1 seeker. The chasers control a leather ball known as the quaffle. They try to get it through the 3 looped goal posts at the end of each side of the field. There is a scoring area around these posts, and if more than one chaser is in there at one time, they get a penalty. The keeper's job is to stop the quaffle from going into the goal posts. If the quaffle gets by the keeper and into the goal posts, it's 10 points for the other team. There's another ball called the bludger that's bewitched to fly around and knock players off of their brooms. The two beaters job is to use their bats to keep it away from their teammates and hit it towards their opponents. The seeker's job is to catch the golden snitch, a tiny ball that is very fast and very difficult to see. The game isn't over until one of the seekers catches the snitch, and when they do, they earn their team 150 points. Whichever seeker catches it, their team often wins, but there are exceptions to this. One example is in the 1994 Quidditch World Cup. Here, Victor Crumb caught the snitch for Bulgaria, but his team still lost. This is because before he caught it, Ireland was up 170 points to 10. So when Crumb caught the snitch, they only got 150 points, making the final score 170 to 160, Ireland coming out on top. A typical game of Quidditch starts out with the referee releasing all four balls from the center circle. The bewitched bludgers and snitch fly off on their own, while the quaffle is thrown into the air to start play. Now the rules. Players cannot stray over the boundary lines of the pitch, but they can fly as high as they want. If they do stray outside the boundary with the quaffle in their hands, it's turned over to the other team. Timeouts can only be called by the captain of each team. Timeouts can extend to 2 hours if the game has lasted more than 12 hours due to the snitch not being caught yet. If they do not return after 2 hours, their team is disqualified. Contact is allowed, but a player cannot grab hold of another player's broomstick or any part of their body. That would be considered a foul. There are 700 fouls that you can commit in Quidditch, a list that has never been released to the public due to the fact that wizards and witches might get ideas. The most common fouls, however, that have been released include blocking the seeker from catching the snitch, excessive use of elbows towards opponents, going through the opposite end of the goal hoop to block the quaffle from going in, any player besides the seeker touching the snitch, flying with the content to collide, hitting bludgers towards spectators, having your hand still on the quaffle when it goes through the goal hoop, deflating or puncturing the quaffle so it falls more quickly or zigzags, and as I said before, more than one chaser entering the scoring area. If a player is fouled, there is a penalty given. The team fouled is allowed to have their chaser try to score against no one but the keeper. Now that we have the rules of the game down, let's go over its history. Quidditch has been played for almost a thousand years and was based in large part to many ancient games that use broomsticks. This includes Stitch Stock, where wizards and witches would fly toward an inflated dragon bladder at the top of a pole and try to puncture it. One person known as the Bladder Guardian was tied to the pole and it was their job to block the others from getting to the bladder. Quidditch took inspiration from this sport, making the Bladder Guardian the keeper, as well as having long poles that allow you to win or score points. Another thing Quidditch took inspiration from was a sport where players holding a ball would have to fly through burning barrels, and when they got to the last one, they would hurl the ball through the final barrel. This was the inspiration for Chasers. They also drew inspiration from a game called Kreothsian. This is by far one of the most dangerous wizarding sports of all time. Players would have a cauldron on their head, and when the game started, rocks and boulders that were hovering above would fall, and players would have to try and catch as many rocks as possible in the cauldron on their head. This was the inspiration for beaters. There was another game called Shunt Bumps, which is basically just jousting, but on brooms. And finally, Swiven Hodge, a sport that's basically tennis, but with a bat and a blown up pig's bladder. The bat hitting the blown up pig's bladder is another inspiration for beaters hitting bludgers with bats. 
Quidditch took inspiration from all of these games to create its own original sport. We get the name Quidditch from Queerditch Marsh. This was the location of the first ever recorded game. It was written down by a witch named Gertie Kettle. It was mostly her complaining about them playing, but her writings reveal much more than her just complaining. She mentions how the ball landed in her cabbage patch, which was made of leather. Leather is the same thing that they use to make the quaffle today. She also mentions how they were trying to stick it in the trees on either end of the marsh. This of course references the goalposts. Thirdly, she mentions how they were trying to knock each other off their brooms using two big heavy rocks. This references beaters and the bludgers. She also mentions a big Scottish warlock. The Scottish are the people that made Creothian. It might have been his idea to use the rocks, paralleling the falling rocks and boulders in the game his people created. Throughout the next century, the game progresses vastly and gets much more popular. Its organization had also gotten much better. The game was now called Quidditch, but spelled with a KW instead of a Q. There was now a position called Catcher, an early version of a Chaser. There was also a Blooder, an early version of a Bludger. And there were actually official beaters with clubs who hit the blooders to try and knock the catchers off their brooms. The goals were no longer trees as they were a hundred years ago, but rather barrels on stilts. The basic game was pretty much all the way there, but the one thing that was still missing was the golden snitch. I covered the origins of the snitch in detail in my last Harry Potter video, so I'll just do a brief explanation for that here. If you want the full origin in detail, I'll link that in the description below. In 1269, the Snidget was introduced to Quidditch. Snidgets were round, fat birds that were covered in golden feathers. It had rotational wings, allowing it to change direction very fast and very easily. The first time a Snidget was used in a match, every player was told to catch it and that if they did, they would receive 150 galleons. This made every player abandon the balls and the goals to catch the bird. This obviously would not do, as it makes the whole focus on the Snidget rather than the actual game. They fixed this by making a new position called a Hunter. It was it was their job to catch and kill the Snidget. When they did so, the game would be over and their team would get an extra 150 points. The Hunter of course later became known as the Seeker. Eventually, the Snidget population dropped rapidly. To save them, they were made a protected species. It was now illegal to kill or use the bird for Quidditch. This led to the invention of the Golden Snitch made by a man named Bowman Wright. He made it the same size and weight as a Snidget and made it have the same rotational wings, allowing it to move and change direction at quick speeds just like its living counterpart. With the addition of the Snitch, it formed the sport of Quidditch that we all know today. There were a few changes along the way of course. They changed many of the names like Catcher to Chaser, Blooder to Bludger, and Hunter to Seeker. The KW in the title was also changed to a Q, which is the same name that would stick from then on. The goals also changed a few times as well. They replaced the barrels with baskets. These baskets worked well, but there was one problem. There was no size restriction, which made the goals vary in size from pitch to pitch. In 1883, the baskets were finally replaced with hoops of a thick size. This perfected the modern Quidditch pitch. Another change that they made was adding a flesh memory to the snitch so that it was able to tell you which seeker grabbed it first in the event of a close call. Eventually, Quidditch got so big that they needed committees to keep it organized and in check. The International Confederation of Wizards Quidditch Committee was founded, which oversaw international Quidditch. One of the biggest things this committee did was make sure that it was hidden from muggles. They first ruled that you weren't allowed to play within 50 miles of a known muggle town, and later they made it 100 miles. This was amended just 6 years later due to the sport's growing popularity. Everything changed in 1692, however, when the International Statute of Secrecy was created. This ruled that all wizards had to go into hiding and could not reveal themselves to muggles. This caused many problems for Quidditch. After a long battle and many protests, they finally came to the agreement that all ministries of magic would be responsible for hiding the Quidditch played in their country. The Department of Magical Games and Sports was also created to enforce this. Any Quidditch team that disobeyed these guidelines were disbanded. 
This happened to the Bankery Bangers when they sent the Bludger off into the night and all of them, very drunk, set out to capture a dragon that they wanted as their mascot. They were intercepted by the Ministry of Magic and were disbanded immediately. Today, ministries take precautions like adding muggle repelling charms. For the 1994 Quidditch World Cup, they put a charm around the stadium that made it so every time a muggle got anywhere near the stadium, they would suddenly remember urgent appointments that they had to go to, forcing them to turn around and dash away from the stadium. As time went on, broomsticks for Quidditch became more and more important to the game. There were many different brands out there, some faster than others depending on the price. The clean sweep broomsticks were pretty cheap and were owned by many of the Weasleys. There's also the Comet series which includes the Comet 260 that both Cho Chang and Nymphadora Tonks owned. During the course of the seven books, we learned about the three fastest broomsticks. First was the Nimbus 2000, which was Harry's first broom. At the time that he got it, it was the fastest ever created. The following year, however, the Nimbus 2001 came out, Nimbus outdoing themselves. Draco's father bribed the Slytherin team to let Draco join by buying all of them brand new Nimbus 2001 broomsticks. Those are Nimbus 2001s. How did you get those? gift from Draco's father. Nimbus was now considered to be the best broom brand in the world. The Nimbus designers, however, were knocked from their number one spot just 12 months later. The Firebolt was a top secret project before it came out. It was developed by Randolph Spudmore. He was the first to use goblin-made iron, giving it additional stability, power and bad weather conditions, a special non-slip grip, and more speed than any other broomstick in the world. The secrets of how he did this are not fully understood, even today. Harry was one of the first to own this broom when his godfather Sirius bought it for him. Over the years, many leagues for Quidditch were created. The league that we hear Ron, Harry, and the others talk about the most is the British and Irish Quidditch League. Ron's favorite team is the Chudley Cannons. They actually joined the international tournament in 1972, but had no faith that they would win, changing their motto from, we shall conquer, to let's just keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. Some other notable teams from the British and Irish League include the Hollyhead Harpies, who are unique because they're the only all-female team. Gwenog Jones, a former Hogwarts student, was the captain for many years. Gwenog Jones, captain of the Hollyhead Harpies. Free tickets whenever I want them. There's also the Montrose Magpies, who were the most successful team in the league, having won 32 times. The Touchstill Tornadoes are another team we hear about in the series because they're Cho Chang's favorite team. They're famous for winning the league five times in a row. They also recorded the fastest ever win in the league, catching the snitch three and a half seconds into the match. The oldest team in the league is Puddlemere United. They were founded in 1163. This is actually Dumbledore's team of choice, and it's also the team that Oliver Wood, Gryffindor's former keeper and captain, played on after he finished at Hogwarts. The Wimborne Wasps is another team worth mentioning. They got their name after one of the players batted a wasp's nest at the opposing team Seeker in the mid-17th century. This is also the league that the Bankery Bangers were in before they got disbanded for trying to find a dragon as I mentioned earlier. A team in the league called the Appleby Arrows had a fan tradition that every time a chaser scored, they would shoot arrows into the air from their wands. This was banned by the Department of Magical Games and Sports after one of the arrows pierced the referee in the nose. Hogwarts, of course, had its own league with four teams, one for each house, Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff, and Slytherin. Each house plays each other one time during the course of the school year, resulting in three games for each team and six games in total for the school to enjoy. Because there are so little matches, each one is highly anticipated by both students and teachers. Who plays in the finals for the seventh game is determined on the total amount of points each team has after they played the other three houses. The winner of the final gets the Quidditch Cup, which is an enormous silver trophy that has been used since the start of Hogwarts Quidditch, most likely in the 15 or 1600s. The cup stays in the winning team's head of house office until the following year. When Harry first started at Hogwarts, the Gryffindor team consisted of Harry as the Seeker, Oliver Wood as Keeper and Captain, Fred and George Weasley as Beaters, Katie Bell, Angelina Johnson, and Alicia Spinett as the Chasers. In Harry's fifth year, Angelina Johnson was the new captain, and Ron replaced Oliver Wood as Keeper. In Harry's sixth year, he became the new captain. Ginny Weasley became the new Chaser and was phenomenal. 
She also replaced Harry as Seeker and was again phenomenal. After she finished at Hogwarts, she would go on to play professional Quidditch for the Hollyhead Harpies, the only all-female team. Some other notable Gryffindor players include Charlie Weasley, who could have gone pro as a seeker if he had wanted to. Harry's dad, James Potter, was also a very good chaser during his time at Hogwarts. Minerva McGonagall was another great player before she got a career-ending injury. The Slytherin players include Marcus Flint, who was the captain and a chaser. And as I mentioned before, Draco Malfoy was the seeker during his second year. For Hufflepuff, there was Cedric Diggory, who was a phenomenal seeker. For Ravenclaw, Roger Davies was a captain and a chaser. Also, Cho Chang was their seeker. Most of the remaining history for Quidditch has to do with the Quidditch World Cup, which is by far the biggest, the most followed, and the most attended Quidditch event in the world. The very first one took place in 1473 and has been played every four years since then. Any country can enter the tournament, and the number of teams varies per year. Once every team is in, they divide them into 16 groups. Over a two-year period, one team comes out on top for each of the 16 groups. During the group phase, each match is capped at 4 hours to prevent player exhaustion, meaning that sometimes the snitch isn't even caught, and the game is decided on goals alone. A win counts for 2 points, a win by more than 50 points counts for 3, a win by more than 100 points is 5 and a win by more than 150 is 7 points. The team with the most points wins and moves on to the playoffs. In case of a tie in points, the winner is the team who caught the stitch the most often or the most quickly during its matches. The remaining 16 teams are ranked according to their points from the group round. They make a final bracket based on that and it works just like any other playoff bracket. Before the World Cup, they would often have mascots that performed a show that showed their country's pride. In the 1994 Quidditch World Cup, the Irish had leprechauns who performed for them. Bulgaria's mascots were Vilas. They performed for them before the match, and they are semi-human creatures that are incredibly beautiful and irresistible to men. They made Harry almost jump off of the balcony while they were performing. Over the years, there were many interesting tournaments. In the very first tournament, in 1473, all 700 possible fouls were committed in the final. In 1809, when Romania was playing Spain, Nico Nanad, a player on Romania, was known for his ferocious outbursts during matches throughout the season. His team tried to substitute him for the final, but were denied. During the final, when his team was losing, he and many other dark wizard accomplices in the stands jinxed the forest next to the stadium, making the trees spring to life. They marched upon the stadium, flattening everything in their path, causing numerous injuries and several fatalities. The match turned into a human versus tree battle that lasted for 7 hours. The humans finally won, and Anand was killed by a very violent spruce. In 1877, there was a match that nobody remembers. The match was planned, a venue was chosen in the Rin Desert. Publicity materials were produced, and tickets were sold. In August, however, the Wizarding World woke up to the fact that they had no memory of the tournament taking place. Neither those in possession of tickets, nor any of the players could remember a single thing. However, players had teeth missing their knees backwards, and half of the Argentina team was found tied up in the basement of a pub. What had or hadn't taken place has never been satisfactorily proven. Theories range from a mass memory charm by the Goblin Liberation Front, or even a massive outbreak of Spattergroit which causes severe confusion and memory loss. They ended up restaging the tournament the following year in 1878. The tournament that took place in 1974 was an interesting one because Royston Idlewind, the new international director and former Australian Quidditch player, said that he loved the sport but hated the fans. He had mistrust with the fans. This led to him banning wands from entering the stadium, and fans boycotted. While the crowd turnouts were low, the appearance of dissimulators started to show up. They were multicolored tube-like objects that emitted loud cries of support and puffs of smoke in the international colors. As the tournament progressed, the dissimulators craze grew. By the time the final came around, both the crowds and dissimulators had grown to an insane record-breaking number. Everyone had their own dissimulator, and when Idlewind made his appearance, 100,000 dissimulators went off and were transformed into the wands that they had been disguising all along. Humiliated, Idlewind resigned instantly. 
The 1994 Quidditch World Cup might have been the most famous scandal when a number of ex-Death Eaters put on masks and started destroying the campsite. They then went after the Muggle landowners, levitating them in the air. The Dark Mark then reappeared for the first time in 14 years, making the Death Eaters and masks run for it. The Dark Mark had been cast by Barty Crouch Jr., who was helping a very weak Voldemort make his return to power. This led to the Ministry of Magic in England getting into trouble, as it was their job to make sure that the statute of secrecy and security was in check. They were heavily censored after this. Royston Idlewind came out of retirement to make a statement saying, A wand ban doesn't look so stupid now, does it? As I said before, Crum had caught the snitch in the 1994 Quidditch Final, but his team still lost. Crum faced another loss in 2002 when he was narrowly beaten to the snitch by the Egyptian Seeker. In 2006, a small African nation won when Seeker Joshua Sankara made an amazing catch. He was promptly made Minister for Magic for their country, but he resigned two days later saying that he'd much rather play Quidditch. In the 2010 tournament, a match that is considered to many to have produced some of the finest Quidditch seen this century lasted three whole days. The 2014 Quidditch World Cup was covered by Ginny Weasley, where she wrote several stories for the Daily Prophet alongside Rita Skeeter. Harry and their kids joined her, and they got to watch the match in very good seats. Ron and Hermione made an appearance, and as did Neville Longbottom and Luna Lovegood. This tournament saw the return of the famous seeker Victor Crumb, who had previously retired. He was 38 when he returned, which is quite old for a seeker. He said that his aim was to win the World Cup before he died, something that he has not yet been able to do. Crumb played magnificently throughout the tournament, beating players much younger than him. In the final, Bulgaria faced Brazil, and Crumb caught the snitch, winning the game and the Quidditch World Cup for Bulgaria, completing his lifetime ambition. Tears poured out of his face because he was so happy. Quidditch will always be one of the most creative fictional sports, and it has developed into such an interesting story. It brings both wizards and muggles together, enjoying this phenomenal game. Thanks so much for watching guys, you can follow me on social media, links for that will be in the description. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be listed on my next video, plus a bunch of other rewards, check out my Patreon which is linked down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you press that subscribe button to help grow the channel. Again thank you so much for watching and look out for more great videos on the way.